In today's episode, we are joined by Mark Jenkins of The Gap. He had his first introduction to tax at the young age of 10, uh, which led him to, um, so far, a 35 year in the accounting industry. We talked about his personal why, his core purpose, um, and this is probably what's kept him in the industry for such a long time. We also chatted about um, imposter syndrome and his view of the profession in the future. So really interesting episode. Let's dive in. Hi, I'm Cheryl. And I'm Dan. And welcome to our podcast. Where we talk to real people about real problems in real situations. Grab a cuppa while we talk founder life. Hello and welcome to today's episode where we are joined by Mark Jenkins, who is one of the co-founders of The Gap. Um, And I'll let Mark explain what The Gap is. And um, yeah, Mark, please do introduce yourself and tell us who you are and what you do. Well, thanks very much for having me, um, Cheryl. Yeah, so I'm Mark Jenkins. I'm a chartered accountant by training. I live in New Zealand in a place called Whakatane, um, where you can legally swear when you say where you're from. (laughs) Um, I've had uh, I guess about 30 years of chartered accounting experience and I've I've tried to quit the industry about three or four times and in the most recent version of um, working in the industry I'm working with accountants helping them to do business advisory with the gap so the gap is a a process engine to help you to market sell and deliver uh, business development or business advisory services to your clients. And you said that you've been in the industry for a long time. So tell us a little bit about your journey. So from like school, how did things go at school? And obviously, for a lot of people listening here are UK based. They don't know much about the New Zealand school system. So please, yeah, share. Yeah, awesome. So um, I, I guess I, I discovered accounting by default. Uh, I As a 10 year old, I was working in a supermarket and um, I got my first pay packet and I'm showing my age now that that was actually a brown paper envelope and I'd work, I was getting $2.25 an hour, which is about about a pound 10 per hour Um, and I'd work for about five hours. So I'd worked out that I was going to get $12.50 in my pay packet. So I'd already spent that money, of course, by the end of the week before I got my pay packet and then um, I opened up the pay packet and it only had $10 and six cents in it. So that was my first understanding of tax. And I thought, that's just not right. You know, don't, why do I have to pay tax? And so that was an introduction to tax. Uh, I then sort of decided that I would do accounting uh, quite late in the piece um, as about a 15 year old um, and started learning things like, you know, how to write out a check. I am showing my age now because I don't even know where my checkbook is now. And I remember my very first check that I signed uh, that I that I paid for was for my university fees, about £125 for the year um, was my, my the check that I had to write out. And I got it sent back to me because um, I had forgotten to sign it. So I was never going to be a good accountant. <laughs> paying too much tax as a 10-year-old, not signing the checks correctly. Um, oh, but, yeah, wow. I decided to do accounting then. And so I went to went off to university and I did accounting in Japanese kind of because they go together really well. Like why on earth did I do that? I've no idea. <laughs> and um, then decided to um, see if I could get a job in, a, in a, um, an accounting firm. And I was lucky enough to get a job in one of the big four or the big eight as it was then. And um, lasted there for about five years and then decided this was not for me. In fact, three years in I quit and moved into the corporate finance area and then two years after that I quit that again so I've left the industry lots of times but so I guess I fell into it um, did I love it um, at times I loved the concept and the aspect of it that I thought it would be but the reality was not what I thought it was going to be so that was kind of the beginning story really mm. yeah. that's interesting I always love hearing how people get into accountancy because it's everyone's story is different isn't it <laughs> Like that. That's really interesting. Thank it's... you. And obviously now you've gone through. I've gone. Sorry, Dan. That's all right. I was going to say. I imagine it's one of those things. A bit like anything with with finance. There's not many people that wake up in the morning and go, "That's what I want to do for a living," is it? So it's it's kind of a way that just yeah. kind of falls into place, isn't it? it is. Well, it's also one of these industries that when you meet somebody and you have the 
awful introduction and you know you share your name and then they can't think of anything else and they ask you what you do and you try and avoid the question because if you say you're an accountant they immediately start looking for someone else to go and talk to so, um, <laughs> yeah we, we come with a bit of baggage and i think if you google the most boring jobs i think accounting <laughs> comes out at um, number two or number three i think i think number four is being a cleaner so i think so so the story goes people would rather clean toilets than be an accountant so we, we don't have any we're under no illusions as to um how popular we are <laughs> no, it is funny i think whenever you say to someone you're an accountant and they, they do like a double take or they go oh really i always like oh that's a compliment <laughs> yeah, exactly. but yeah it's such a shame the stereotype is like that though isn't it because actually quite a lot of my job is fun <laughs> it's not boring mm. And we actually help businesses do so much. So it's, yeah, I'd love to change that stereotype at some point. But and I guess that, I guess that's the point, isn't it? That we, that the reasons that I left the industry multiple times was because I wasn't achieving what the vision was for, that I wanted to achieve as an accountant. So I thought an accountant would help people make more money. I thought they would help them you know do be more successful in their business and it wasn't until I started doing advisory work in my accounting firm some years later uh, because long story short I ran a ski chalet in, in the Trois Valais and Mary Bell for a few years working for Silver Ski and and then I came back to New Zealand and decided I better settle down and get a real job get a haircut and get a real job and so <laughs> the only I, I knew I wanted to live at a Hopi beach it's a beautiful beach um, in the Bay of Plenty in New Zealand, it's um, it's just an amazing place. And so I knew I wanted to raise a family here, but the only thing I could do was to start an accounting firm. I didn't want to do that, uh, but ended up having to do that. So I sort of fell back into it. But then I really started doing that the, the vision of what I thought accounting would be. You know, I was actually helping small business, small medium sized business owners do better. And that was when I really started enjoying it. As you're saying, Cheryl, it was it was fun then. You know, it was making a difference, um, and and I really enjoyed that. So um, yeah, part of the, part of that journey there. Yeah. yeah. And is that how you came to found the Gap and get that all set up? Yeah. So that was um, that was again by mistake. Um, I don't think people who start businesses typically have a, a, a plan. I certainly didn't have a plan to have a a, a tech company that operates all around the world I certainly didn't do that in fact when I went to sell my accounting firm I'd, I'd been I had my accounting firm for about 17 years what my children grew up being well looked after by the accounting firm but I, to be perfectly honest I just got a bit bored with tax so I, I'd had it had had enough but it had been pretty challenging through that time and I wanted to go and travel again so I decided to sell and um, when I sold my business, Viv Brownrigg, my now business partner at The Gap, she, she said, well, how have you generated so much revenue from advisory? And I said, oh, well, I've got all these systems that I've developed for how to do this. And, and she said, oh, well, can I have a look at those? And I said, well, they're not that, that pretty. So I brought over my 25 red folders that had all the marketing, selling and delivery content for um, for all the services that I offered, business planning and financial awareness coaching and KPI improvement coaching and marketing planning, all that sort of stuff. And long story short, Viv said, I think we could make a business out of this. And, and I said, oh, look, no, every accountant will have this. Um, they've, they've got their own system. And, and it turns out that they don't. And then about, that was in 2014, about 2018, had another real imposter syndrome moment came across to the UK. We had four GAP members in the UK at that time, and we were running an event. It was going to be in Manchester, or it was in Manchester. And I was walking along, carrying not the not the system kits this time, but the box full of, bag full of um, journals to share and marketing content. And I said to Viv, this is just not going to work. By morning tea time, we're going to be laughed out of the room. We're, you know, Nobody's going to be interested in this. The UK will have all this themselves. But it shows that they didn't um and mm. by morning tea uh, people were, they came back after their morning tea and they stayed till lunchtime and then they came back after lunch and that was the first of our gap master classes so very humbling experience and and nervous nervous all the time you know is it going to work is it going to be okay and yeah so quite quite a journey and quite a um 
quite a challenge, challenging time. Yeah, right the way through. Yeah. How I think it, every how business owner can relate to that imposter syndrome. I'm sorry, Gwanda. That's all right. There's a little, there's a little, a little bit, bit of a delay, yeah. isn't there? Mm. Um, how did you deal with the nerves at the time? Uh, I don't really know. I remember walking along. Um, we uh, we went past a, like a, a post box, you know, a real quintessential um, ER2 um, box, you know, post box. And I thought, <laughs> I know now I'm in the wrong place. This is just not going to work. And I, But we were walking. We were heading in the right direction. And we just had things we had to do. You know, we had to set up. We had to get the room organized. And so I just, just boxed on. I just carried on. When I when I present now and I present reason, uh, you know, a lot of the time, I still get nervous before I present. And I actually have learned to embrace those nerves because the nerves actually help you to perform a little bit better. The, running on a little bit of an adrenaline rush, it does, so long as you are not fearful of that, that adrenaline rush, so long as you are, you know that it's coming, it will help you. It's that it's that fight or flight reflex. I guess it's that limbic limbic brain stuff where, you know, the saber tooth tiger is going to come and get you, and that's what you're fearful of, and that that gets you to move forward. If if you've got the saber tooth tiger coming after, and you feel fear, and you paralyze, you get paralyzed, and you don't do anything, you're going to get eaten. So, in, in my way of thinking, it's like when when you have that fear, galvanize it into action and actually move forward with it, as if you are running away from that that saber tooth tiger or, or move, you know, just you're moving forward. So I, I tend to challenge, um, channel that fear or that imposter syndrome moment or that, that, that uncertainty into, into action. Mm. Positive. Ultra focus and yeah. um, in the first instance, a little bit of distraction. We're doing other tasks to keep focused and keep on going. <laughs> Absolutely. And I think that's the thing. I mean, I've seen you present and you do come across really confident and I would never know that you was nervous. So it's you clearly do use that energy and present well. But, you know, I'm, I'm the same. Whenever I've had presentations, it's, I'm always trying to focus on the bits beforehand, the bits that I've got to do to be able to then do the presentation. And that does, it does help, doesn't it? Absolutely. And thank you for your kind words. I, I I think everyone who presents gets nervous beforehand. Uh, you know, you're, you're worried about, are you going to go over time? Are you going, is your message going to hit the spot? Are you going to forget the key points? Typically, someone's going to tell you something just before you start speaking. You go, oh, I must remember that. And you, then you've got that in your back of your mind. Will I remember to say that? Will I remember? And, and so you've just got to get, get started. And I think the key thing with, presenting is you've just got to know your material inside out and you've got to be confident that your own authentic self can come out so when you're going to speak don't be thinking oh, i've got to follow the script i've got to be exact say exactly what it's you know i mean we haven't scripted any of what we're talking about today you, you might have some notes that sort of thing but i have no idea what you're going to ask me i've no idea what i'm going to say but I'm very confident that I know my my content. I I'm happy to talk about what I've done, and hopefully there's still some people listening, and they might find it interesting. <laughs> I'm sure they will. Definitely. Um, yeah. No. I get. Yeah, I don't script either. I think it just comes across more natural when you just talk as you, isn't it? It's more authentic then, isn't it? And, Absolutely. Um, yeah, definitely have notes. But yeah, as you say, as long as you practice or you know your stuff, you're going to be fine, aren't you? So yeah, I don't do scripting either. I don't like it. <laughs> yeah, it's a dead so giveaway much. when somebody's reading off the script. No, I used to sorry, spend then. so much time. Yeah. You're right. I'm sorry. Um, it's yeah. There's a little little bit of a delay. I used to spend so much time preparing paperwork and putting it in a certain order, in the order that we were going to go through it, and the, and, and what I was going to say each, each piece, um, as each piece of paperwork come up, and it, it wasn't really the way to go, because one, um, the client, you know, people you're talking to, presentation, client, whoever you are talking to, was just totally disengaged, because it's dictated by you, rather than dictated by what they're after. So since I've just gone armed with with 
with what I need in no order and just having a conversation and picking out the bits as they come up and or talking about it, it, things just so much better for everyone involved. Absolutely. Mm. Um, so I just wanted to go back to you mentioned at the beginning that you did Japanese at uni <laughs> so have you can you still speak Japanese or is it was it Japanese the language you was learning or about Japan yeah I can speak a very little bit of Japanese but um, <laughs> when I was in when I was in Japan it was a um Sorry, when I was at high school, Japan was like the, the, the growing economy. It was the, the, the great news story. And so I thought international finance, I thought that's what I would do. Um, as it turned out, I think the last time that I really spoke Japanese was in Cairo, um, having been on a tour to the, the pyramids. And the tour guide with me was a Japanese. It was a, he was an, an Egyptian tour guide who only spoke Egyptian or Japanese and I was sitting next to him on the bus and I, obviously I couldn't speak Egyptian but I could speak pidgin Japanese so we were it was quite a funny funny experience an Egyptian and a Kiwi speaking Japanese to each other very badly both of us but, um, but yeah no I've, I've forgotten most of it and um, I mean I love Japan I've, I've traveled there it's an amazing country um, the food's just superb so um, yeah but it, it never never transpired that I did um, yeah, you know, the corporate finance thing. I had a dabble in it at, um, in my KPMG days, uh, but it, it, but um, I never never connected Japanese and accounting. In fact, it was a nightmare at university because one was the arts department and one was the business department, and the the lectures clashed. And I had to get my friends to write notes, and you know, I still have bad dreams about missing lectures and and having to catch up. So, yeah, it wasn't it wasn't the best experience. I think you did. All in the Thank end <laughs> yeah. uh, no. and do you have any Japanese clients now in the gap no no we're definitely a um, an English English language um, um, technology company it's there's so much content in there which um, we, we have had uh, People from um, Belgium and, and the Netherlands say, could they translate our, our content for us? We're just like, we've got 3,000 documents in there and uh, as a minimum. It would just be an absolute Herculean task to try and to get that to work. So, no, there's cheapers. I'm from a tiny little town with a population of 6,000 people. And, you know, to then to go and try and take on and do some work in Japan as well, that'd be a little bit too much for me, I think. <laughs> That's great. but obviously you do as you've mentioned work internationally so you work with the uk what other countries do you work with yeah so i was in um sydney last week at ZeroCon, and we've got oh, probably about maybe 25 percent of our customer base is in um, australia maybe just a little under 50 percent in new zealand about 20 percent in the uk and then a growing base in like Canada and um, South Africa and um, yeah, so and and a few Asia, a few few clients in Asia, not not many. It's not it's not been a big focus of ours. It's people because of the internet and and technology and and companies like Zero. People find you and and so they the early adopters are the ones who go, yep, we want to we want to we want to be front of the wave. Hence, how we got our first four members in the in the UK. One of them actually travelled to um, to um, New Zealand to an event and um, met me there. Saw me speak at that event and and said, "Look, you know, we, we think there's an opportunity for you to do this in the UK." And funnily enough, she's our UK accountant. So um, it's um, it's been quite a quite a, a, a long-standing um, professional relationship there, and that sort of got us started in the UK, which was quite interesting, really, just purely by chance. Mm. It's amazing how these things happen, isn't it? just by chance just because you decide to go somewhere or you have that one small conversation things come from it don't it it's just yeah, absolutely. incredible i suppose that's the thing of keep putting yourself out there isn't it and i suppose that's why they just keep being relentless keep putting yourself out there and things like chance or whatever you want to call it do come along don't they yeah i think i think it's a little bit about keeping you putting yourself out there but also 
being prepared to stick your neck out a little bit and and say something that's a little bit different you know what what's you know um what is it that's different about the gap? I mean, there's so much talk about advisory. I mean, for goodness sake, we've been talking about advisory since the 1980s. It's not a, it's nothing new. But what's different and what we've stuck our neck out a little bit to do is to build a software platform that enables people to market, sell and deliver advisory services. So the real how-to piece. Um, and it's looking for that thing that somebody else hasn't yet done. Um, that's close to what you understand and you're comfortable with, um, and that you've got a hunch that it might work. But you certainly don't know at the time whether it's going to work. I mean, any entrepreneur will tell you that they they didn't know that it was going to work. They probably failed two or three times beforehand, um, and we've certainly had some epic fails. I mean, that our first our first software platform we did, well, the second one actually, the first one was a franchise um it was used by a franchise company and it was just basically here have access to our content and download it all if you want and then you can switch it off and keep it all because it was that that easy to steal all our ip so that was a great way to learn what not to do um that was the first <laughs> thing and then we then we used an um, indian software developer we outsourced that to um, to india uh, which was a great experience at the time it was it was cheap and it was fast um, but we know the analogy ch cheap fast and good quality choose any two um, you can't get all three so we had some challenges with the quality of the work and and that was just because we didn't we weren't great we didn't know what we didn't know we weren't supervising what was happening particularly well um, and so we had to completely rework all of that as well so then a couple of failures along the way there but man they give you your biggest learnings and you you certainly come back smarter as a result. I learn way more from my mistakes. And I know it's a cliche, but it's so absolutely true. You, you, you don't make the same mistake twice. Um, and unless you try something new, you're just going to keep get, getting what you've always got or you'll get less. So you've got to try some different things and then just reflect and go, well, what did I learn? Just a quick shout out to our sponsors, Zero, who, in my opinion, are the best accounting software out there for small business owners. One of the features that is amazing <laughs> is the fact that the software is online meaning you can access this anytime any place from any device meaning that you don't have to rely on it being on one spec computer check out zero today at zero.com that's zero with an x x e r o dot com you know, i love that and it is fail first attempt in learning <laughs> and since i learned that and i that whatever you call it acronym or whatever i've just been like oh yeah and I think another thing that I was, I can't even remember who taught it to me, but when you've got a decision to make or you're going to try and do something, you're not actually deciding to do it. You're just experimenting and seeing if it will work. And therefore, if it doesn't, it doesn't feel quite as bad because you didn't decide to do it. You just decided to try it and experiment. And I think I've always stuck with that as well because it just makes me feel a little bit less like I'm failing, but I'm just trying trying things out, seeing how it goes. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and it comes back to, uh, you know, we talked about, you know, putting yourself out there, but also, and, you know, we, a lot of people talk about your why, you know, why do you, what, what's your core purpose? What, what is it? Why does your business exist? And why are you doing what you do? And so for me, this goes back a very, very long way, right back to that $10 and six pay packet, you know, wanting to find out how I could pay less tax or starting at university, wanting to find out how accountants can learn how to do business better. Um, and then in my own accounting firm, the, the core purpose statement there was unlocking business potential. My accounting firm was called Key Accountants, so there was a bit of a play on words there. But I wanted to unlock the potential in my clients' businesses. So, And then now at the gap, we, we had an initial core purpose, accountants accelerating small business success. So it was all about the small business. What, what can we do? So my why is, I, you know, my, my personal why statement is, um, you know, I believe in you. I, I'm, I'm here to help get the best out of the people that I work with because I, I totally believe in you. So um, that, that combined with our new core purpose statement, with our rebrand with a gap, which is advisory made easy, we're always saying, if we're putting it out there that we're going to make advisory easy, we better do that. We better deliver on that mm -hmm. promise. If I'm going to have a core purpose in my accounting firm of 
uh, unlocking business potential, I better do more than just tax and compliance work because I'm not going to unlock any potential by doing that. So I think putting yourself out there, but having a clear statement of why, um, and, and it's been done to death, I'm, I'm sorry to say, there's a lot of people talk about their why, um, and it's just words, but they don't, they don't live and breathe their why. It's not, it's not, there are many who do, of course, but there's a lot of people who, who have just been through the process because it's the right thing to do, but they don't, their team don't know what the why is, they don't understand the connection. So as to make an impact, that, that's not going to be the, the same. We just, just um, heard all about that in, um, in a presentation at Zericon in, in Sydney, and it was just so powerful to look at some really strong um, why statements that, that people were putting out there and what it had done for their businesses. It's, um, it's quite compelling. Mm. There is... Yeah, it sounds really interesting. <laughs> what, the why is really compelling, compelling isn't it? Um, I mean, just I'd say two things, just going back a little bit, um, when we were saying about uh, failing and things like that, it's I always kind of say, say to myself, what's worse, the fear of not giving something a go or the f- fear of regret of never actually giving it a go? And it's always the fear of not giving it a go. So, you know, you, you go with that. Um, the other thing with the with the why is um, Simon Sinek has got a great book on it. Start with why, and it's just a phenomenal book. Um, but it's really really interesting because see the some of the greatest companies in the world are built on it, built on why, and everyone in that organisation knows the why. They're all sailing in the same direction on the why. Um, and I, it's really interesting when I imagine you go into business, some businesses and you, you ask anyone, well, what's the why? They probably have no idea. Do they? <laughs> so, no, yeah. they don't. Yeah. I can't remember. Oh, it's James Ashford always tells that story about, is it NASA where the, somebody went in and asked one of the cleaners what their purpose was. And he said to put a man on the moon. And I'm really paraphrasing here and I've not said it very well. And I'm sure if James is listening, he's probably cursing me. But um, (laughs) that always just made me like think and just like everybody in that company knows their purpose. No matter Mm. what job role they've got, their purpose is to put a man on the moon. And I was just like, that's just incredible. Yeah, Yeah. the the Apollo principle with the JFK one. Yeah, so I mean, I think... I think what's really important is to have a purpose, be, cl- be clear on what your purpose is and for that to be authentic rather than just nice words to have. Um, you know, the, the, the Simon Sinek um, thing you're referring to, Dan, you know, the golden circle, it's just, it's so powerful. I mean, mm-hmm. and I think he uses the analogy of, of Apple, you know, their why is to um, uh, constantly um, challenge the status quo. And, and so how do they do that by building... Um, beautiful software that's um, user friendly and, and you know and easy to use and then what do they do which is on the outside of that golden circle is computers and phones and iPads that sort of thing so people are not interested in phones and computers and iPads that's the commodity piece accounting on the outside when you do that's the what that you do if you can talk about your why in the beginning so that my why was unlocking business potential then people are going to say, well, how do you unlock business potential? And so that was the lead in to a conversation around business planning and coaching and business improvement type work. And so that how showed how we were different to the traditional accountants. And yeah, the, the what was, yeah, we, we so, uh, and so, sorry, the how was uh, what was on the back of our business cards, which was helping you make more money, pay less tax and have a great lifestyle. So that was the challenge then was okay. So, what do you do to do that? Was the the coaching services and, and as well as the compliance. So, it took the conversation away from the boring into the yeah. more compelling and the, what was more interesting. And um, and so, yeah, I would like to say that everybody in my team knew what our our why was. It was um, we would in team meetings we would talk about how has somebody lived into our core purpose during the month so it was reinforced and equally how they lived into core values. Um, and we had awards for people who had demonstrated that they lived into the why well. Because, you know, when you're growing a business, you, you can't do it on your own. You have to have the team on the journey with you. You have to employ people that are smarter than you. You have to surround yourselves with, with experts. Um, and then, this, you know, 
what you can achieve is so much better than what you could do on your own. And, and, and the beauty of this for accountants is how they can partner with their clients and combine the expertise of their clients with their own expertise and get a result that's better than either party could achieve on their own. And recognizing that accountants have some expertise and the business owners have a lot of expertise in other areas. They each have weaknesses and so they, they cancel each other out and you, you get a much better result. But we've got to create that opportunity for, for them to work together. And the why makes that a little bit more compelling as to why, we, why would you want to do that? Mm. Mm. So interesting. I totally agree. It is everything comes back to that why, doesn't it? Mm. And if you don't know your why, then how how can you help others? <laughs> One of my favourite things on that is you said about yeah. Apple is in in um in the latest. I think it's the latest Steve Jobs film where they're developing the Mac and. They're all waiting, and and um, when they develop it, he says, "No, I want it to have two ports. I want it to have one for a keyboard and one for a mouse. That's it. I just want two ports." And um, the person helping him, uh, I think it was was the access to him, but yeah, everyone's going with nine ports. You know, like lots and lots of ports for lots and lots of functionality. He said, "No, it needs to be simple, easy to use, and easy to understand. It has two ports: one for a keyboard, one for a mouse." <laughs> Yeah, and I think, yeah, I just thought that was really powerful because it's not necessarily about always trying to progress and always extra functionality and always this and always that. Um, it's just, yeah, sticking to your message and then obviously it worked eventually, didn't it? So, yeah, And I think as well that's a really great example of you don't need a million and one shiny things. You just need that core thing that aligns with your purpose, those core services or products go for it because the more you've got all these fancy million and one extra things the more it confuses people and I know for a fact I don't use half of the things on my MacBook or my phone <laughs> but yeah. we use the things we need don't we so and I think that's the same with business isn't it you don't need a million and one fancy services you just need the things that are going to get your clients to where they want to be absolutely yeah and and you've got to be able to be prepared to meet face-to-face -face, ideally or in these days online like we are now how incredible that we can be having a conversation across whatever it is twelve and a half thousand miles apart from each other but um, you've got to create those moments and those experiences um, because if we have relationships through our our keyboard um, by email or all these various social media channels it's you're not building a depth of connection with somebody and so you know anybody who's in business that that's the powerful piece. It's the yes. It's your why, and it's your your how. So what's what? How do you stand out different to your to your competition? But part of that is about that personal touch and that that relationship that you build. And and I think that's going to become even more of an issue with you know AI and and all the technology enhancements that sort of thing. We we've got to make sure we people talked about the human firm a lot. You know we've got to make sure that we are keeping those connections going and I mean you look at you look at how people you know bounce back and I know that wasn't with the loans that they got in the UK but that, that <laughs> how they bounce back into meeting each other after COVID and how yeah. how special that seemed to be able to get back face to face with people we we love that connection humans want that connection so um, yeah connect it through your why with your how as well um, but don't, let's not forget that it's about people and it's about relationships totally totally agree there it is it is amazing the technology we've got and what we can do but yeah when I met you in person that was just so much more I don't know what the right word is but that was makes that connection so much stronger doesn't it than mm -hmm. just doing yeah. even just doing this but this is a great opportunity for those and it brings everyone closer together as well I think doesn't it because as you say you're thousands of miles away yet you're here we're here together talking so which would never happen in well it does happen in real life because you go to you make events and things but on a day-to-day -day basis it wouldn't happen in real life would it because it's not possible mm, mm. So, yeah, it's amazing oh and um, there was something else i wanted to pick up on that you mentioned and i've didn't make a note of it and i can't remember it so that's really clever 
No, it's gone. One thing Cheryl did start to mention a bit earlier on, and I think I cut over the top of her, sorry for that, um, was she um, started saying about Im imposter syndrome. Um, that was it, yeah, imposter syndrome. Yeah. yeah, tell us a little bit about how you've come to deal with that and, yeah. I don't know that, I don't know that you ever... Yeah, I don't know that you ever overcome imposter syndrome. I think you always, I know there's going to be people that are going to disagree with me, but I think you've got to make the imposter your friend. You've got to, the thing about imposter syndrome is that it's going to sharpen your saw. If you use the, um, the um, Stephen Covey, you know, the seven habits of highly effective people and n number seven is sharpen the saw to, to really stay focused and learn and, and you know, that failing as as part of that learning first attempt in learning as you've mentioned Cheryl which is a that's a learning for me today I'd never heard that um, analogy yeah. so that's that's great <laughs> or acronym so so I think the the key thing for imposter syndrome and I, I read a, um, a a really nice um, LinkedIn post from Linda Steffens in in Australia today and talking about the imposter syndrome and how how you can make it your friend and so there were three examples and I won't remember all of them but but one of them that stuck out for me was that when you when you have the imposter syndrome, you it makes you prepare better, and so you actually end up doing a better job. Whereas if you go in confident, then you won't necessarily do a good job. So make the imposter your friend in that situation. Um, so just recognise it, know that it's there, and turn it into a, a, a good result. Um, the, the other thing with imposter syndrome, and I, I, I can only remember two out of the three, is that people who carry that imposter syndrome will typically build better relationships with people because they'll show more empathy. Um, and I absolutely believe this. If you're, if you're going in feeling confident, you're going to go in with a bit of bluster. Whereas, whereas if you go in with a bit of maybe doubt or maybe not, not fear, but a lack of self-belief, then you might ask some better questions or you might engage a little bit more. You're certainly going to come across as more approachable um, and so you will build better relationships. So so I think, Dan, the idea that you, you try and overcome the imposter, no. I think make the imposter your friend and and work with it. Um, I, I certainly certainly believe that I do that and having read that um, that blog today, I, I'm, I'm quite humbled by that because I think, well, okay, great. Um, because I've done lots of courses to help me with, you know, my own personal development, and there is there have been some amazing courses that I've done on this. Um, but I still carry that imposter; it's still there. Um, so I'm just going to embrace it from now on. Yeah, no, my coach always says to me as well: it's like the imposter syndrome feelings are because you're pushing yourself outside your comfort zone as well. So it's something you're not. Oh, what's the word? No, you're not doing all the time or it's not confident in doing and you are just pushing yourself and you're growing and I think since I had it explained to me in that way I, that helps as well and I love that make the imposter your friend I think that is mm. just it's just such a good way of putting it isn't it make it friend and embrace it and go with it mm. it's the same as that that adrenaline that adrenaline rush of you know, before a presentation, make that your friend as well. Know that that means that you'll perform better. Um, don't say, stand at the front of the room and say, look, I'm really nervous. Just go with it. You know, if you, if you stumble a little bit, the audience is forgiving. They're not, they, they don't want to be the ones up, up on, the, on the stage. And by the way, as soon as you're on the stage, you're the expert suddenly anyway, whether you, whether you feel like the expert or not, you, you suddenly become the expert. So just run with it. Mm. Yeah, I think and another piece of advice somebody gave me as well, which I thought was really good, is they don't know what you know. You always know mm. more than them because, again, you're the expert, aren't you? So if you do forget a little detail or there's something you missed out or something, they, they, the audience probably won't even know that or the person you're talking to won't know that. So you've not failed. You've, and that's just Absolutely. an opportunity to do that next time, isn't it, to mention that thing next time and whatever it is and I think that that was really helpful as well and you the fact that just knowing that you may not feel the expert 
but to the person you're talking to, you are. So you just can't can't get it wrong. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I think that's that that um, aiming for success, not perfection, is a is a nice mantra that I like to live by. And so, uh, an imposter would say, if you got it ninety nine percent right, and you covered ninety nine percent of what you wanted to cover, the imposter would say, well, what about that one percent? Well, you didn't do the one yeah. percent. Whereas turn turn that into wow, I put out 90% of what I needed to, to share. That was probably more than enough for, for my audience to hear anyway. Um, and so just mm. yeah, dull, dull that imposter down in, in, in that moment. Mm. Mm. Oh, I like I it. I love that. That's such a good one. Yeah, that's so good. And that aim for success, not perfection. I, my mantra these days is definitely not perfect but done, not perfect but done. And you can tweak afterwards. But if you're aiming for perfection, you're never going to get it out there. Whereas at least if it's 90%, 95%, it's out there. And then you can tweak it as you go, can't you? And, oh yeah, I Absolutely. like that. Aim for success, not perfection. I've written that down. I like that. <laughs> I <might feel> that. <laughs> Honestly, credit you. But no, I love that. Oh, no, don't, don't, don't credit me. That's not my words. That's come from someone else. That's... Um, that's a that's a great piece of um, R and D. Rip off and duplicate. I like that as well. <laughs> like I might even get a tax credit for it. <laughs> How about R and D? We'll, we'll just. <laughs> yeah. I think we'll 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 edit that that accountant joke out. That that's not going to fly. <laughs> oh no, I love it. I know oh, that's staying in. <laughs> 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 we do have a lot of accountants listen so i'm sure it will definitely fly but even business owners will would love that it's fun oh. oh well thank you so much for sharing your story and everything so what is there anything else that you want to achieve that you haven't achieved yet is there anything else that you're still hoping to to get out there or is Absolutely. What's next for you, Mark? <laughs> Look, I've got I've got so much unfinished business, and um, you know, I guess I've been fortunate that I've 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 my accounting firm was great. It helped me to raise my family, that sort of thing. But my personal crusade and the unfinished business I have is to stop the rhetoric around advisory um, and have more how to. Because what I really want to see is the accounting industry. There are some amazing accountants that I've got to know all around the world. They're all great people. They're extremely talented, skilled, um, intelligent people. And we've got a major disconnect where small and medium-sized business owners, on the whole, are unsupported. Um, they don't get the support that they need and they don't necessarily see accountants as the ones who can help them to run a better business. And at the same time, we have accountants who are so busy with what they're doing, they don't have time to talk to their clients as much as they would like to. In fact, they're fearful of getting more work from their, their clients because they've got too much to do already. And my personal crusade is to help accountants to see that less is more if they had fewer clients, they could offer a better service. And if they did that, then their clients would thank them dearly for that because the attention and the, the way they could be proactive and the combining of their expertise with their accountant's expertise will help them to achieve what we refer to as the three freedoms, you know, the financial freedom, time freedom and mind freedom. And so my personal crusade is to not talk about technology making accountants redundant that's just a load of rubbish that's never going to happen that what's the risk for the industry is that we get too busy as accountants to serve the people who really need the help um, and in the current economic times it's even more important accountants need to accelerate small business success and I, my personal crusade is to help as many accountants as I can to see that that is going to be a fantastic why um, for accountants, and it'll be it'll be so well received by the business community. So, yeah, I'm definitely not finished, Cheryl. I've got lots more to do. Oh, I know that. Yeah, <laughs> oh, that's really cool. And I think the other question I had was, if you was an accountant and you had your time all over again, what would you do? 
Um, that would be a hard question. I've tried a few different things. I was a dishwasher 40 hours a week in the in the um, in um, Summit County in the US. So I could go skiing every day. I tried being a ski guide in France. I didn't like that much. Um, I've been fish, do a lot of fishing, that sort of thing. I'm not sure. I I don't know what I would do differently. I mean, I, I, I have loved being an accountant and hated it at the same time, but I think I would have, anything that I tried, I would have loved and hated it. Um, I don't see myself as, um, I don't, I don't have regrets. I don't, I look at every moment that I'm, that I'm in and think, am I making the most of this moment? And so I don't think, oh, what if? So I, I don't have an answer to that question of what, I, what I would have been. What I would share is that what's really important is to live in the now and plan for the future. So what is the now? What are the experiences that you need to, to create with family, with friends, with loved ones? Make sure you do those now um, and create the time and the space to do those so, so that you don't have regrets. But also have an eye on the future. So what, what's the plan? What's the vision? What's the bigger picture? What's your why? And get that business plan documented so you're clear about what it is that you want to achieve. And so for me, it wouldn't matter what business I was in. It would still be the same. It would be, what, what can I do to help, you know, to empower others? I believe in you. That's my core purpose. And what, what can I, in this current role, how can I help accountants accelerate small business success? But equally, at the moment, how do I get balance with what I'm doing, you know, to do the things that I want to do in my life and with my family and my friends? And therefore, what do I need to build into the future? So it doesn't matter what you do. Um, we're all, we've all got something we can be great at. It's just a matter of finding that thing that we, that we have got the passion to make a difference doing. Mm. I love that. Thank you. <laughs> Mm, really great um did you have anything else to ask them before i wrap up well the only thing i was going to say is that I, I i did do, when you said it find the uh top five most boring jobs um for you and one is data analysis number two is accounting <laughs> number three is tax or insurance work number th- four is cleaning and number five is banking <laughs> we have a job in front of us, don't we? <laughs> we definitely do. We definitely yeah. do. I find it interesting because accounting not boring covers, people. Accounting covers four of those. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, it doesn't cover. <laughs> you do it properly. You do oh, data analysis. You do you do tax work and you do banking. So there you go. <laughs> Mm. Exactly. Yeah, definitely need to change that. <laughs> but accountants are not accountants are not boring. I mean, I'm not no. saying that just as an accountant. I know thousands of accountants, and man, do we have some fun? We've had some great, great events that I've been to in the UK and Australia and um, New Zealand, and it's just it's incredible. Accountants are great people. Um, we need more people, younger people, coming through wanting to do this uh, this work and there's a great opportunity to you know, really make a difference to, to small and medium-sized business owners. And, and you know, that, that's what gets me out of bed in the morning. That's what I love doing. Um, and I'm not, I'm not finished. I've got plenty more I want to do. And, and I know that you're the same, Cheryl, with the work that you do. And so, um, yeah, keep doing what you're doing. It's been, it's been great to be chatting to you. No, it has. And I would say for anyone who does think accountants are boring, check out some of the videos from ZeroCon because <laughs> you will definitely change your mind then. <laughs> definitely. And some of the events I've been to, wow, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Cool. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Mark. And um, we will let you get going now because it is very late evening for you. So we will let you go. Um, yeah, thanks for joining us. Oh, it's thank been my pleasure. Much. Thanks for having me, Dan and Carol. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks for listening. We hope you enjoyed the episode. If you did, please like and subscribe. And we'd love to hear your feedback. So please do leave us a review or drop us a DM on our Instagram at Found a Life Podcast. See you in the next episode.